This is a Canadian government website. You can find it at canadiancrown.gc.ca Government of Canada, Canadian Crown. From the Government of Canada website, the Queen of Canada. Her Majesty was the first of Canada's sovereigns to be proclaimed separately Queen of Canada. In 1953, a Canadian law, the Royal Style and Titles Act, formally conferred upon Elizabeth II the title of Queen of Canada. Her Majesty was proclaimed in Canada with these words, By the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, Canada, and her other realms and territories, Queen, Head of the Commonwealth, Defender of the Faith. Queen Elizabeth II became the first monarch to be separately proclaimed Sovereign of Canada. The proclamation reaffirmed the new monarch's position as Queen of Canada, a role independent of that as Queen of the United Kingdom and the other Commonwealth realms. So you see, Queen Elizabeth's role is independent of all the rest of the roles that she's playing when she plays her role here in Canada. The Queen's Role as the living embodiment of the Crown, Her Majesty unites Canadians, gives a collective sense of belonging to our country, and anchors our sense of national identity and pride. New Canadians swear allegiance to the Queen. So do members of Parliament and the legislators, military and police officers. We do not swear allegiance to a piece of cloth, office, a document, a constitution, or a political entity. Rather, we swear allegiance to a person, a person who embodies all these as well as our collective values as a people. Her Majesty was proclaimed in Canada, was proclaimed in Canada by this saying, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom, comma, Canada, and her other realms and territories. Queen, head of the Commonwealth, defender of the faith. Defender of the faith. Now, notice that in the declaration that brought forth this office, or brought forth this person, they stated that, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom, comma, Canada. So you see right there, they're making a distinction between one kingdom, the United Kingdom, and another kingdom, Canada. So when you do a trace back, we know that when Queen Elizabeth became the sovereign of Canada, that was the first time that a monarch had become a sovereign alone of a country. So we are independent of the United Kingdom. We are considered, if you will, the Her Majesty, the Queen Elizabeth II, is a sovereign alone and independent as Canada, not combined into the United Kingdom. So that person, Queen Elizabeth II, was the first monarch to be separately proclaimed Sovereign of Canada. Notice that, separately. And her role, or that role, is independent. Notice that, separately and independent. Of that as Queen of the United Kingdom or of other Commonwealth realms. So though she may be recognized as Queen or Her Majesty in the United Kingdom, and she plays a role in that kingdom. It's not the same role, it's not the same duties, it's not the same responsibility, it's not the same uh, governmentship, if you will, as we have here in Canada. Nor in her other Commonwealth realms, the kingship or the queenship that she's ruling under is not the same as Canada. Canada is an independent, separate sovereign or monarchy or structure that is ruling Canada that is independent of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth realms. So if you go and if you try to study <coughs> excuse me, the Commonwealth realms, for example, um, the United Kingdom, and you see the Queen and the way her kingdom is structured there, and you try to apply that to Canada, you will run up against some walls. You will run up against some contradictory information. Because the queenship, or the structure that was set up here in Canada, is totally independent and separate from any other monarchy or commonwealth system that is going on. To understand what is exactly going on here in Canada, you have to go through 
the rules, the laws, the enactments, the legislation, the Constitution Act, and all the kit and caboodle that applies here in Canada to get the full picture. If you try to jump into other Commonwealth nations or realms, if you try to jump into the United Kingdom and get a, a comprehension of what her role is here in Canada, it will cause some confusion. Oath of Allegiance Act 1985 Article 2 Oath of Allegiance Every person who, either of his own accord or in compliance with any lawful requirement made of the person or in obedience to the directions of any act or law in force of Canada except the Constitution Act 1867 and the Citizenship Act desires to take an oath of allegiance, shall have administrated and take the oath in the following form and no other, no other. I, state your name, do swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, so help me God. No other oath necessary. Article 5. It is not necessary for any person appointed to any public office for any mayor or other officer or member of any corporation or for any person admitted, called or received as a barrister, advocate, notary public, attorney, solicitor or proctor to make any declaration or subscription or to take or subscribe any or oath other than the oath of allegiance set out in section 2 and such other oath for the faithful performance of the duties of the office for the due exercise of the profession or calling as is required by any law the canadian citizenship act oath or affirmation of citizenship i swear or affirm that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, her heirs and successors, and that I will faithfully observe the laws of Canada and fulfill my duties as a Canadian citizen. So, Her Majesty is the Queen of Canada. And we're talking about now Queen Elizabeth II, the person. And she is the Sovereign of Canada. Everyone else, every other person who is located in Canada, on this territory, everyone else swears allegiance to her person, or to this person. In that oath of allegiance, it says that you, we will, or you will, be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II. This is the structure that is in operation here in our country. Her Majesty, the ruler, sitting on top, and all under her have bear their allegiance, their oath towards her, whether you believe it or not. If you say, well, I never took an oath, I never bared an allegiance towards her, well, she says, just by the fact that you were born on her territory or in her land, she has laid a claim to you. She laid the claim to you. You may not have laid a claim, you may not have said anything about it, but just the fact when you came out of your mother's womb, all this laid a claim upon you and said, you are one of my servants and you are one of my subjects. The National Defense Act, 1985, a Canadian enactment. Her Majesty's Canadian ship, Her Majesty's Canadian ship means any vessel of the Canadian forces commissioned as a vessel of war. Her Majesty's forces. Her Majesty's forces means the armed forces of Her Majesty were ever raised and includes the Canadian forces. The Criminal Code of Canada, 1985. Her Majesty's forces. Her Majesty's forces means the naval army and air forces of Her Majesty, wherever raised and includes the Canadian forces.
these regulations and enactments, they're given royal assent. They're given force of law. Force of law. And when you look into these enactments, these regulations that they try to apply against you, it says, therefore, inside these laws, therefore Her Majesty enacts the following. So the one who is giving force of law or saying this is okay is again back to that role of Her Majesty playing out the ruler, the sovereign, the hierarchy of the country enacting a law giving it force of law saying that this will apply against my subjects against my servants who are present upon my territory and that's what's going on so we learn that this Queen Elizabeth II Queen of Canada the defender of the faith it's Her Majesty's subjects and servants that's who we are and it's Her Majesty's air forces or forces, police forces and it's Her Majesty's Army and Navy. And it's also Her Majesty's land. Everything belongs to this character, Her Majesty. Which she's not, but nevertheless, everything belongs to her. Now, would you believe that she claims that Jesus Christ, you know, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, the Trinity of the Bible, She claims that this whole kingdom that she set up and that she has forced you and yoked you and burdened you to live under and to serve and to be a subject of, that she is doing this on behalf of this. Romans chapter 13. And I'm going to be looking down. This is a biblical reference from the Holy Bible. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant, for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are, they are God's servant agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of the possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. So very clearly, it is telling us that Her Majesty, Queen Elizabeth II, Queen of Canada, Defender of the Faith, according to this book here, the epistles that Paul wrote, that she is correct in what she's done to our human rights and fundamental freedoms that she is correct in at least being or claiming to be the authority, the sovereign and the ruler of Canada. And you, by, if you will, trying to claim against her, trying to say that, well, I'm a Christian, or I am a, a well, you wouldn't say disciple of Jesus, but I'm a Christian, and, uh, and I don't believe that I should be serving you because I'm, I'm God's child and I should be free. Well, they have verses and references in there that states that they are the authorities set up by God. And these claims here in Romans 13, there's more than that, I'm just keeping it simple, but those claims there in Romans 13, guess what? They are recognized. I don't 
I'm not talking about the validity of these claims. I'm not talking about if they are real or true, if they are God-sent or not. Nevertheless, whatever is written in here, in this context, well, uh, United Kingdom, the rulers thereof, they agree with it. Canada, the rulers thereof, they agree with it. And the list goes on and on. So if you try to send a claim and draw out of this book to tell them that you have the right to be free and that you don't have to be a subject or a servant to the kingdom that they've set up, well, that claim most likely will fall upon deaf ears because of the fact that they have their own claim. And that claim has been well recognized for hundreds and hundreds of years. So you come into conflict now. If you try to follow some of these men or human beings that are out there who have religious doctrines that rule their mind, their thinking and their heart, and they believe that what, what they've understood or they believe a certain um, religious doctrine and they try to apply it to their freedom and start contacting the government trying to draw doctrines out of this Bible to say that I'm allowed to be free, leave me alone. When clearly, this Bible, when you look to it, it teaches nothing but submission. Submission to authorities, submission to the higher up from you. Even when you go to your religious service, you are taught that you are the layman, and that there are others, such as pe uh, pastors, or preachers, or apostles, or teachers, who are higher than you. And you must submit yourselves to them. And again, that's drawn out of the Apostle Paul's doctrines and teachings. So, you're going to run up against a heck of a lot of trouble if you try to claim your freedoms and your rights by saying that you are uh, a child or a servant or a subject of the Christian God or the God of the Bible and therefore, or even of Jesus Christ, and therefore you don't have to be subject or servant to Her Majesty. It won't pan out. So now, the only rebuttal to that well, not only, but the rebuttal that would be most prevalent, that would be faced, is to say that, well, also the Bible teaches that if the rulers in authority are in rebellion against God's word, then we should not follow them or not submit to them. That's why I'm trying to claim my rights, because these rulers, what they're doing is not in accordance with God's word, and, and I, shouldn't be following, uh, I shouldn't be following them. That's why I can claim my rights to that. You see that throughout biblical references in the New Testament there is a structure of hierarchy, there is a structure of rulers, and we are taught to accept it. In the, in the biblical references we are taught that this is from God. So no matter what way you try to draw your conclusion, you're stuck. Because that book is telling you that you are to be a subject and a servant to the powers above.